well-being. It's a word, right? I mean, we hear it everywhere. How, I mean, how, how often are you guys hearing well-being on a pretty regular basis? Yeah, of course we are. And, and I actually think the fact that as a society and as a culture, we're prioritizing overall well-being is really an evolution that we have. And I think it's a really wonderful one. So I want to talk a little bit about the importance of how money plays into that and really can be a grounding to some of the things I want to share. Um, we often think that having money can solve all of our problems and leads to happiness. While that's not entirely true, being financially secure can create a sense of well-being. Being able to afford essential expenses and having additional funds for vacations, outings, emergencies can create confidence and ultimately a sense of relief. However, when we're experiencing financial troubles, living paycheck to paycheck, which by the way, did you all know that 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck? And so oftentimes we think that money happens at a different socioeconomic level, but in essence it's happening all over. Sorry, I'm digressing on that. Or if you don't have the resources for an unforeseen expense, your health can be impacted. Financial stressors have been found to directly correlate with poor physical and mental well-being. To manage your physical and mental wellness, it's important to understand how your finances and health are interconnected. I love this slide in the image that we're in the middle, and when we talk about well-being, knowing that 78% of us are living paycheck to paycheck, we can do all of the cardio workouts, cross training, running, whatever your thing is, or all the yoga. But if we're stressed out about how we pay that electric bill at the end of the month, that's a really tough place to be. And ultimately can really sabotage your inner peace, which is really what this is all about. All right, so the toll your financial struggles have on your health. The connection between physical and financial health has been long studied. So here are just a couple of those things. Debt-related financial stress, increases the odds of depression by 51%. Financial stress can manifest in physical symptoms. And I don't want to out anybody, but I want you to think about times that either it has shown up in your own personal life, in your family life, in your, your parents, and these are things that are just real. And sometimes we don't make the correlation to the stress that we're having, even when we're pursuing your education and you're thinking about how do we afford to pay that or finding that next job. So much of that stress can live in your body, not just in your mind. But many, many problems can lead to very unhealthy coping mechanism. You know, sometimes we're doing other vices under pressure, alcohol or drugs, or oddly enough, shopping. So it's these different triggers and understanding what some of those triggers are that are happening and where do they live. But I have found that the trigger, and not, not necessarily, these are researched, but Sherry and I, Liz and I, others at the credit union, we engage with members that are thriving in life, and we are dealing with members that are thriving in life on the surface, but under the surface are super stressed out about that one hit of an emergency that showed up. And I always give those members tremendous credit for coming in and having the conversation, because as scary as it is, you have to have that conversation. And that's where the no judgment, no shame zone lives, right? Because we have to have safe places where you can come and share. Just like Laura said, you know, this may not be the space to have our Brene Brown vulnerability moment, but to know where resources lie, either today or in the future, I think are really important. And knowing that if you are struggling with mental well-being, being really honest about where that could live, and sometimes it lives with our finances. 
All right, so money and health directly impact one another, and results can manifest in many ways. Below are a few statistics that highlight how money can be a great source of stress that can affect your health. First one, experiencing financial anxiety can be debilitating and lead to decisions that do not benefit your health, such as foregoing trips to the doctor. If you do not feel like you have the right health care and you are not getting some of those preventative test results, then you are forsaking your health because of financial reasons. 66% of Americans, 21 to 34 years old, experience financial anxiety. Compared to those at 34 to 49, those are at 60%, and 50 to 62 year olds, 51%. You know, I was equally bummed out and encouraged by this stat. And I'm like, clearly not one age demographic has got this stuff figured out. So the core root is really understanding a little bit about money and making some of those decision points. Because the reality is, if you do not learn to do better, aging up is not magically going to help you with your relationship with money. Um, financial stress can be debilitating for employees as well. It can make their productivity suffer and lead to lower work quality. An employee who is financially stretched each year loses one month of productive work days. Like, additionally, they are twice as likely to seek a new job. So you can find employees that are on the treadmill of making more money. And if your root cause is that you have a tendency to live above your means, funny thing happens, you'll make more money and oftentimes your lifestyle will level up to that new income, therefore creating this cycle. And Lazar and I were talking a little earlier, and I had touched on it. So I'm going to own my Gen Zer, like I'm a oh, Gen Xer. I think I'm a wannabe Gen Zer. Um, I'm a Gen Xer, right? So how many millennials are in the room? How many Gen Zers are in the room? Yeah, and I'll tell you, I have millennial kids, they have Gen Z kids. And I'll tell you, there has been an evolution with how you all are perceiving old time periods. Back in my day, you graduated from high school, you went to a good college, you went to work hard, you married, you had 2.2 children, and you lived in a house. We were very much in a box. You have your mortgage, you have your car payment, you live in debt. That is something that was kind of societal norms. And what I have found is that with each generation, we're getting savvier in what our own values are versus the collective values that are being put on you. <coughs> Laura and I were talking about that with children. It's, it's their, their kids. It's recognizing y'all have a lot of options out there. And some may be prioritizing more experiences. So your lifestyle might need to look a little differently than others. I'm sharing all of this because having real grounded knowledge in financial management will allow you to choose the path that you want to choose. If it's an entrepreneurial path, if it's a path that you would rather have a job that you are working to live versus living to work. And so I think that in and of itself, this is the generation that I think could flip things on its lid and really kind of erase some of those paradigm cultural shifts that have lived in the past. All right, so what is financial health? Why is it important? Your financial health refers to the state of your finances, such as how much savings you're going to have, right? I mean, there's no real set answers. We're going to talk a little bit about guidelines, but I will tell you, just like there are thought leaders with money management, there are a lot of different ways to get to success. How much you have in your retirement fund, how much debt you owe, and how much your expenses are compared to your income. Determining if your financial health is in good shape is an essential for a number of reasons. 
Not only can it help you figure out if you're on track to meet your own personal financial goals, but it can help impact how well you handle problems in the future. Being in good financial health can lay the foundation for a stable, secure financial future. It means you won't have to worry about living paycheck to paycheck or being troubled if there's an emergency. That right there, guys, is everything. You want to be in a position where you feel like you can absorb a challenge. And if that challenge is a flat tire, and that's a $200 expense, which, you know, relatively speaking, that's a big deal when you're a student, or versus having money to be able to go and have an experience with your friends. Those are all things that you want to be able to think about as you have with your money, because sometimes not being in a position to do something can trigger you and cause that kind of um, stress or anxiety. Being financially healthy means having enough money for the emergency funds, as I share. Considering your financial health means planning for retirement. If you look over your financial health, you'll be able to plan and save accordingly. So there's a lot about compounding interest. There's a lot that's being, that's all smart. So you've seen the research that if you start saving at a younger age, that that will continue to compound and have those resources for your future. There's this whole trend of retire early, of people that made a major decision in their 20s and 30s and their 30s to actually sacrifice certain things to prioritize the space that they're able to retire in their 40s and 50s. Clearly, I'm not in that demographic. But it is a very interesting thing that I think from a social perspective, there are different avenues. So these people will actually, I was just reading about this, talk about they had almost a scarcity of mentality when it came to their 20s and 30s and really kept their focus on that future goal of retirement. No judgment. I think that's really cool. But I also believe that you should save, but in the moment, your money should find you joy as well. So if we're doing all of this hard work at school and in internships to get to that next point, be sure you're in that space of joy now, that if you do choose to treat yourself, right, don't judge yourself, enjoy that. So I actually have a more abundant feeling when it comes to money. And I think that if you're grounded in your values, you're not always going to get it right. But if we judge ourselves for making decisions that we think we should be better at, guess what that does? We're just going to continue making bad decisions when we want <coughs> So that's kind of my own soapbox on that. A crucial benefit of being in a good financial health is having a low debt to income ratio, which is how much debt you have versus your income. If you're regularly checking in, monitoring your financial health, you can prevent yourself from racking up too much debt. Well, I'm probably sitting in a room where some of you guys are, might be walking out with six figures with this student loan debt, and that sucks. And I feel that. And so it's even decisions about taking steps and what that looks like after the fact. But what I don't want y'all to do is you're made a decision to be fully immersed and taking advantage of a world-class education and knowing that that was a decision. But if you allow that stress of future to weigh you down, then you won't be present to maximize a decision that you made. And I will tell you, that is something that we have seen in our members, I've seen in students that we've talked about, and even seen it in my own children with the decisions that they've made to pursue master's degrees. But knowing that they also secured positions that gave them a higher earning potential. So I just wanted to kind of level set on that. Um, this whole conversation about financial health, mental health, physical health, really was inspired by Kathy MacArthur. Kathy, are you here? Is Kathy back there? I am here. So I just wanted to give her props because I do think being grounded in some of this can help. Now we're going to share a little bit more of the tools. 
Before I advance, is there any questions or any comments or thoughts about what I just discussed? Yes. So being a college student, what are some ways that you would say would be good to like create a passive income rather than just like actually like work a job or something like that? Actually, asking you that question, Lazar, considering you're the entrepreneur between the two of us. <laughs> I mean, but they're really, I mean, the thing that I've noticed now making money versus back in the day when I was in college and making money is there is more ways to make money from, you know, social influencers, ambassadors for brands that you love. I mean, I could probably be better served putting every single one of you on a panel and asking each one of you, what is one passive idea? And we could probably have a whole round table on that. So to your point, I'm not trying to skirt the question. I'm obviously in a very traditional job. But what I find to be interesting about people who have passive incomes are those that may have a traditional job, but found joy in doing something else and found a gap or a problem that needed to be sold or solved and move forward on that. Because whatever you're doing, you don't want to be a slave to that idea or that passive, you know, that passive income stream. It should be something that you really enjoy. Anything else? Yes. So being a college student, grad student, uh, I was wondering, maybe you're going to tell that later on, uh, what is considered as healthy spending? Because, you know, I, I heard that you said you believe in abundance, and sometimes people tell me, even buying that uh, milk tea is a waste of money. But that's like my pleasure. And if it's your pleasure, don't let anyone judge you for what brings you joy in that moment. But what is your name? Shakta. Shakta. Thank you for that transition. Because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the tools. And you know, we're going to talk a little bit about financial goals. I'm going to talk to you about a spending plan and give props to my colleague Sherry Shannon because this is something she really talks about. So notice how I'm not calling it a budget because people hate the word budget. It's like a four-letter word. But we're going to give you a more macro look at how you can start prioritizing some of the monies and then decreasing spending or increasing income. You know, some of the conversations we're having. And then more expenses that income, um, talking about household expenses and credit cards and blah, blah, blah. But really the most important part is knowing when to seek assistance. And my whole thing is seek assistance when you have a question. Don't wait till you've gotten yourself so stressed out that you haven't tapped in to some profession, you know, some people who are experts in this area that can really help you navigate. But when you're talking about spending plan, I want to talk to you about life spending budget notes. So this graph is literally tailored for individuals up to about 40-ish. And so it's the 70-20-10 spending plan. This is not your budget. It's not your mom and dad's budget. This is more fluid. This is taking into account that you guys are in the building stage of your life. When we're younger, our needs are different and we have more debt to pay off. <coughs> Student loans, we may be carrying credit card balances. We may be having entrepreneurial lens of credit or some of those resources. So let's talk about that 70%, right? So your 70% is the biggest pot. It is your essentials. So this is what you spend on things to keep a roof over your head. These are keeping your electric bills. These are your water bills. This is your basic food. This is everything you need to do to show up in life and just be able to walk out of a place. 70% of your gross income, excuse me, your net income, so that's the money you actually walk away with, should be in that 70% essentials bucket. 20% is for what your wants are. That's where you have your tea that gives you joy. This is where you're saving for your vacation. This is where you are having that opportunity to go on on a Saturday night and have fun and not stress out in the morning. 
Note that 10% is your savings. So people will often say, I actually have more money to spend on my wants than my savings. And we're saying yes. Because what happens is, I don't know if y'all have ever been here. So I'm going to create a scenario. Tell me if this resonates or if you've even heard somebody that did it. They're going to jump back on. We're going to be really good with our money. I'm only going to spend money on things that I need to have and my savings. How long does that last? You can like fall off the wagon really, really fast. So our whole philosophy on a spending plan is that if you don't give yourself resources for fun and things that you want, you ain't never going to follow it. So this is your guideline for up to about 40, right? Here is your guideline for beyond. When you've had less student loan debt, when you are in a position, this monthly budget, this 50, 30, 20, is very optimal. 50% of your net income should be towards your rent, your car, your utilities. 30% should be your fund money. And that could be for short-term or long-term goals. 20% becomes your savings. Do know that your 401k contribution counts towards that 20%. We always say, we want to have individuals, well, Sherry and I disagree about this. I like to have everybody with a $500 in a savings account that's accessible for you for an emergency fund. 50% of people do not have $500 for an emergency fund. So when an emergency happens, what do you think they use? What? Debt. Yeah, they use debt. They use credit. And so my whole thing is use 500. Now my colleague, who probably has a better goal, wants to have? At least 1,000. At least 1,000. So I like to say, get to 500, celebrate that, and start building to 1,000. Now, there's also a philosophy that you want to have three to six months of savings to cover your needs, not your wants, people. Because if you're, if you're in a spot that you need to tap into that three to six months, you ain't going shopping anymore, right? You are covering your needs. And the old paradigm would say, in case you get fired. The new <coughs> paradigm will say, in case you want to fire your job. So you want to put yourself in a financial position that you have options. And so when you can think about things, not in a way, in case something bad happens to me, but in case I want to make a radical shift in my life, I have a safety net of about six months that I can do that. Very smart to just be very thoughtful about it. Again, it's changing your philosophy that you have with money. Living within a 50, 30, 20, or a 70, 20, 10 allows you to have short-term goals and longer-term goals. And I would encourage all of you guys to kind of be thoughtful about where you see yourself from a money aspect in the next year, three years, five years. And really think, these are my goals, write them down. We all know the power of writing your goals down and writing a number around there. But what I would really encourage you guys to do is not just the materialistic things that you want, but what are the feelings you have if you're able to um, secure some of those goals? All right, credit score. We're gonna turn, we're gonna change gears a little bit. Who is familiar with the credit score? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a thing. Like, everybody knows about credit scores. And credit scores really have changed since 2008, 2009. And you know, at the end of the day, it's what banks use to determine if you're going to get a loan. And not only if you're going to get a loan, but how much is that loan going to cost you? 
it could also determine if you're going to get that next apartment lease. It can also determine if you're going to get a dream job. Way back in the day, um, there was a young woman who, at the University of Illinois, was going to get a dream job at a, a pretty famous woman's company, and the credit wasn't great. And she was excited about this position, but this company was going to give her a corporate credit card, and they pulled her credit. And the reality was her credit wasn't great, and they didn't want to put her in a tough spot, so they, they rescinded the offer. And so more and more companies are looking at your credit score because it also talks about your character and how you prioritize your money tells a little bit about who you are at person level. And so credit scores isn't just from a banking perspective. It really shows up now in different ways, including your insurance, like auto insurance. You know, all of those things, credit score does play a role. So this is interesting. This came out in Consumer Reports last summer. And it really talked about the difference between how much, you're, how much more money you're paying. So I'm going to ask a question. Let's say, all right, this young lady who loves The Cure. I'm going to pick on you for a second because that's one of my favorite fans as well. And I'm going to ask, to ask you a question. Let's say you want to buy a car. And you come into the credit union, and your score is 820, and it's beautiful. And my score is like 520, and it's not great. And we're both going to be given <coughs> How do you think, who do you think is going to get the better experience? Do you think this young lady at 820, or do you think me at 520? You, right? We both will. Because we won't know. It is intentionally designed that when we're extending a loan to you, we're excited and delighted. It didn't matter what your credit score is. We generally probably won't even talk about it, but you'll get a letter later showing where your credit score is. And then you can come and look at a graph like this and get a feel for how much more money you're spending on that same loan. Thank you for playing along with me. So that is something to be very mindful of. This is all a sales process. And so customer service is key. So if I'm at 520, I'm showing up, and 820 is right there. Our experience will largely be the same. The difference comes in your pocketbook and how much more you're having to pay for some of these things. So here are some guidelines. And there are some areas in your FICO score that are in your control and some areas that are not. One area that is not in your control-ish is the length of credit history. So Lazar and I kind of had a little conversation about Dave Ramsey. And I have a love-hate relationship with Dave Ramsey. There are some things that he talks about that I do appreciate, but I don't think it's realistic to be a ghost, and that's what somebody who has no credit score is, because most Americans need to have some sort of debt if they're gonna buy a car, or especially if they're gonna do a major purchase like a mortgage. The two areas that you have the most influence on is payment history, 35%. Let me tell you guys, Today, in this day and age of finances and all these financial technologies, if your bank doesn't make it super simple to make an automated payment, get the heck out. And I guarantee they will. So there are things today from a technology space that you can auto just set a payment in the round and make that payment. Even if it's the minimum payment and you're going to go back and add more. So I'm going to tell you a personal story. I preach this, right? I do this, I preach, I'm all about that. But I also am very good about paying my bills. As a matter of fact, I really love paying my bills. I'm somewhat old school. I write a ledger, I write a check. I do it twice a month. Well, we had kind of a family emergency last November. Nothing horrible, but something that threw me off my cadence. And for like the first time ever, I missed a couple payments. 
If I had followed my advice, which by the way now I have, that would never have happened. And that right there is why you need to have automated payments, because it's 35% of your score and life happens. It happens to the best of us. Amounts owed. Let's talk about that. That's a little trickier to understand. Let's say I, we're gonna talk about you now. Let's say I, you have a new credit card and you have a $3,000 credit limit. Woo -hoo -hoo. So really what you want to do is spend no more than 30% of that, which would be $1,000. Because if at any moment you're over that, it starts to pull on your credit score. Even if you pay it all off, depending on when they report to the bureaus, it can hurt you. So one of the things that Sherry, Liz, and I talk about, look at it at 10%. If you've got a 3,000, then you know 10% is about 300, maybe up to 500, and then pay it off. The trick about credit cards is our cycles are about 28 to 31 days. So you really need to pay those off and you get charged interest. Think about when you use a credit card and you're not paying it off, it's like you're writing yourself a salary increase. The funny thing is, it's going to cost you more money in the long run. So I'm a big believer in credit. I love credit. We have a cash back card. I love taking cash back. I have an airline card where I prioritize some of my spend because I really like those miles. But it would hurt me, even with those cash back features or those airline ticket opportunities, if I didn't pay it back, the interest that I would be spending would actually negate the benefits I'm receiving. So amounts owed, keeping well underneath the usage is a really important piece. And then new credit, it happens like, I, you know, the credit union has, um, we have those financial tools and you can see your, your credit score. And sometimes if you've gotten something new, your credit score will dip for a new line of credit. It will go back up but it does dip a little bit. That's the new credit part. Types of credit is an interesting one. They don't want to see you only in credit cards. They want to see you in an installment loan, which is maybe a personal loan, where you have a you know, $1,000 loan, making that up, and you're making regular payments, and it ends in a specific time. Or a car payment, where you actually have an asset tied to your loans. That helps in different types of credits. Okay, guys, this is the basics. You know, take a screenshot of this. This helps you really understand your FICO score. FICO is generally the preferred method, although there's a new scoring called Vanguard. And Vanguard is now taking into consideration things like utility payments. So it's like, good grief. <laughs> Not that all your utility benefits are going to help you, but if you're late on a utility, it can deem your score. Any questions on FICO scoring before I move on? Yes? So I've heard people talking online that when they pay off like their car loan, your FICO score actually goes down. So how does that work? Have you seen that, Sherry? It's because the mix changes. So if that's the only, your only installment, and then you have revolving, if you pay off that installment, it could temporarily cause a dip in that score. But what you keep is the payment history is still, that's gonna stay on your credit report for seven years. So it'll still be out there, but it will, you'll see it temporary just because the mix changes. Thank you, that's good, I appreciate that. All right, <coughs> okay. The other thing we'll talk about credit stuff. Fraud, holy smokes. Raise your hand if you've been affected by fraud. It is a thing, guys. And, and I'm with chat GPT, the fraudsters have gotten smarter. <laughs> Hard. All of them have helped them look get a little savvier in how they get involved. So here is something I think everybody should do, is go to annualcreditreport.com. This kind of gives you an idea of the screenshot. It is the federal government's site that allows you to go into your credit report for each of the bureaus, TransUnion, Experian, or Equifax. It used to be you can only pull one 
credit report from each bureau like once a year. But since COVID, you can pull as many how often you want. Here's what you want to do. You want to go in there, pull. It's not going to give you your credit score. But you want to make sure that the things that are showing up under your social security number are accurate. If you've had a late payment, if there is a medical debt, you want to be sure that it's yours. And if it is, dispute it. You have no harm, no foul to dispute. This is a big shift that happened in 2008. It used to be that if there was a consumer saying there was a mistake, it was the consumer's responsibility to document and show why this was a mistake. It's flipped, and that's why you have this. Now it's back on your creditor to tell you and to clarify why this isn't a mistake. And they only have about 30-ish days to do so. So it's worth going through here. And you really want to see this. Biggest reason, you want to do it before you need credit. Because you do not want to graduate, have your dream job, buy your car, and realize you've been a victim of fraud. And now, instead of getting ready for your dream job, you're now having to you know, really undo some damage. So if every single one of you went to annualcreditreport.com and just checked what was on your bureau, I would be so happy. That would be such a good thing. But this is also a source of anxiety for some people. Some people just get super stressed out if they're going to apply for something. One way to immediately have confidence is to know that there's nothing out there working and now you have it within your purview to do so. And this is the only one, it's not always the first one that pops up on Google. That's why I did a screenshot so you can take a look at it. But it's annualcreditreport.com. They won't ask you for money, and you'll eventually end up at the three different bureaus, but this is the way you can access that. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about credit unions. Laura did talk about that for six years, I did go national and work for Credit Union National Association. That was super cool. I think what I loved most about doing that is I got to engage with communities all over the country and see how credit unions are really helping. And one of the things that we really talk about is we own a really unique space in the financial service region of being trusted with just trusted information. And you can go talk to some of our financial people and you may want to do something and we'll literally tell you, you could probably afford this, but you'd probably live better if you came down to this level. So it is really realizing that credit unions were created to really serve that space in the marketplace, which is important. And so at the credit union here, I just, you know, this is just some of the things that make us unique. This being said, most credit unions fall within this bucket. And the interesting thing about credit unions is they're collaborative. So for the most part, if you bank with a credit union back in your hometown, you can bank with us too. So credit unions really share their resources, their ATMs, their networks to allow our members and to have a very nimble, easy way. But you know, we've got more ATMs in Bank of America, which is kind of a myth. So one of the biggest myths that we have, University of Illinois. Most people don't think they can join. <laughs> And that happens to a lot of credit unions as well. So just know that you know anywhere you are, there's a credit union that you can come to. And your money is safe. We are insured by NCUA. The unique thing about NCUA versus FDIC is NCUA is also our regulator, which means credit unions are held to a very high standard. We're generally not a very entrepreneurial thing. It takes us a lot of time to make decisions to expand resources because we don't take big bets. We take small bets on families and small things within our community, but it also kind of gives us an extra layer of safety and soundness. And it's because we're right here in your community. So digital banking, you know, I talked about digital banking because if you don't have one, ours is number one rated. You should check it out. It's pretty cool. What I love about most is the commitment we've had to financial wellness. So if you're on here 
And you can tap into some of our financial well-being tools, including navigating if you want to buy a car. And it will tell you what interest rate you'll have, right? What it could do to your credit score if you do this, and what your payments would look like. So you can kind of crunch the numbers, all of the you know, comfort of your own couch. So I think that's a pretty cool thing. And I think more and more financial institutions are offering that. And again, it's a way to make your life much easier to be able to have as much information to be empowered. And with that, you guys are really great. So thank you. I'll stay up here. Sherry and Liz are here. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. But I just really appreciate your time and your engagement during this. And um, thanks for letting us come out.